Saying we could be funny, like those Volkswagen people. You see this yet? I have. I don't know what I hate about it the most, the ad or the car. You know, they did one last year, same kind of smirk. Remember, think small? It was a half-page ad on a full-page buy. You could barely see the product. I don't get it. Elvis just got back from West Germany. Why not put him in it? <laughs> The Beetle, of course, had started life in the 1930s, designed by Ferdinand Porsche. And he had this idea not of building a posh limo, but building a people's car. He felt that Germany in particular, Europe, needed a simple car that would get the ordinary man motorised. Hitler had the same idea. He thought it would be a good thing for the people. When the war ended, Germany was in a very, very poor state. And the Allies were keen to build it back up. And the rest, if you like, is history. I mean, they started production, the car did quite well, it was very reliable, sold in quite good numbers within Germany. And a lot of GIs took them back to America. American cars had got bigger and bigger and bigger with fins and lights. And if you were driving last year's car with the big fins, oh, you had to get rid of that because you didn't want to be seen driving around in that. You had to get this year's car, which had smaller fins, you know. But of course, there was as there always is in these things, the other side to that coin in that there are a growing number of people who thought, this is ridiculous. Why do I want a car that long that drinks that much petrol? And the Volkswagen then sort of became a smart car to buy. DDB at that time had smallish bits of business. Uh, car account was a big thing. Although Volkswagen's budget wasn't like Ford or General Motors. I think there was a feeling that if the agency got this car account and did some good work on it, it could land one of the big boys. I think Burma also was a bit of a lover of the underdog. A lot of his clients were quirky. A lot of them were Jewish products, ironically. And of course, this was the complete antithesis. You know, this was a born in the Nazi era, a German car. To be completely honest, I was wondering what was going on in Burmbach's head because it was, it really had Nazi connotations to it, the car. And uh, I didn't think it was something that we should do. And then he said, not only do we have the account, but you're it, I think he said. And I said, me? Why me? What have I done? Off we went to the fatherland. And it was a gigantic room. It looked like a football field. They kept us together in one spot, and they unveiled the uh, first Volkswagen as designed by Porsche with a little help from Hitler. And he did, they showed us maybe the millions that came off the assembly line. And, a couple of other little things. I snuck off, and uh, Julian looked at me like, uh-oh. And I went foraging for uh, jeeps and tanks, etc. And I found them way in the back, you know, and I pulled the, the tarpaulin off, and I was on top of a jeep with a machine gun, and I started to go, you know, ah, 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 ah. And I said, Julian, duck, I don't want to hit you, you know, and I'm going, and I'm, he's saying, oh, it was terrible. And the Germans were all embarrassed, and etc. Finally got home. I said, Bill, like, Bill, we got it, we got it. He said, well, what, what do you got? You got the advertising? I said, no, Bill, we don't have the advertising, but I figured out the marketing problem. So what is it? I said, Bill, we have to sell a Nazi car in a Jewish town. Um, and of course, he just didn't want to hear that. He just didn't want to hear it. Oh, well, I felt that, uh, that the car was uh, so utterly preposterous that, uh, that we had to Americanize it as quickly as possible. And, and maybe get somebody like Dinah Shore to do a, a, a singing commercial like, you know, she was doing at the time. See the USA in your Chevrolet. And uh, I thought we needed something really fast, quickly, like that. See the USA in your Chevrolet. America's asking you to call. Drive your Chevrolet through the USA. America's the greatest land of all. I mentioned it to Burnback, and uh, I didn't get the first base with that. We weren't doing that kind of advertising at all in Burnback at all. And uh, uh, anyway, no matter what the product was, we were doing what we thought was intelligent. Uh, don't underestimate the public type of advertising. I put together three of them. We needed them, and then I, 
remember I went to uh, St. Thomas with my wife, rather depressed about the whole thing. And I came back, and people were talking about it. I mean, at parties, everywhere. They were talking about these Volkswagen ads. I couldn't, I guess I had another look at them. And I uh, didn't quite get it myself. Because they weren't, they were so simple that they were simplistic, I thought, but they weren't, apparently they weren't. Now, I don't think people realize quite how vulgar advertising had become at that time, which is why the work of Dordain in, in, in New York was so revolutionary. I mean, no one had really realized that, how awful it was before. And therefore, how amazing a Doyle Dane ad, and particularly a Volkswagen ad, looked in a magazine that was filled with rubbish. And so you suddenly come across these beautifully pristine, simple, desperately simple ads, and they stuck out like a sore thumb, you know. We, we just took black and white photographs and, uh, of the car, and with a minimum of, of retouching, no models except when we needed somebody to drive it or, or to push it, like we said in one ad, if it runs out of gas, it's easy to push. So we had a man pushing it, and that's why he was there. So the directness of the photography, I suppose, was really remarkable. The cars were in, in limbo. There were no backgrounds at all, nothing but the car. And, uh, and, and I did a lot of things to that car. I, I showed it very dirty. Uh, I showed damaged Volkswagens when we were talking about the availability of spare parts. Nobody had ever seen a dent in a car ad. Uh, at one time, we didn't show the car at all. We just showed the psych, which was just a blank white page, and said, no point in showing the new Volkswagen. It still looks the same. And of course, that negative was a big, fat positive. Bill Burnback, first the Volkswagen campaign, then the Avis campaign, then the Levis campaign, you began doing anti-advertising. Instead of pretending your product was fabulous, you would take what was wrong with your product and turn it into something honest that would make people want it. The same thing with Lemon. Uh, that was theoretically a bad thing to say about a car. The idea there was that we showed a perfect looking car but claimed there was a blemish on the glove compartment, and therefore that car missed the boat. But it was the simplicity of it, of course, that was the first thing that attracted you to it. It was incredibly simple. And, of course, simplicity is the hardest thing to achieve. Getting something to be really powerful and simple is incredibly difficult. The other thing was its wit. Uh, and the other thing was that it laughed at itself. And nobody did that in advertising. The thing about the way they looked and everything, you have to put down to Helmut Krohn. He was a Bauhaus-influenced art director. The, the page was neat, clean, simply laid out. The typeface was a bit like the car. It didn't have any fussiness about it. It was straightforward. It did its job. He shot the car without any crap around it because that was the purest way of showing the car. The copywriting, too, was very... Um, ordinary, straightforward, offhand. It spoke like a New Yorker at the racetrack. And in fact, Julian Koenig, the guy who wrote it, spent most of his time at the racetrack. Chrome was always complaining he wasn't in the office. It was Levinson, Bob Levinson's copy that was the most influential to all of us. And it was an attitude to how you speak in an advertisement, which was absolutely revolutionary. He put at the top of the copy, Dear Charlie, and then wrote the copy as if he was talking to his best friend. And he was put at the bottom, you're sincerely and best, Bob. And all he ever did was obliterate dear Charlie, take off the bottom bit. That's how they got the tone of voice. Part of it uh, was that people enjoyed reading the ads, you look forward to the ads. And the quality of the advertising itself can create aura and personality for a product. So when people said, gee, I like that. You see that Volkswagen ad? <laughs> that reflects favorably on the car. This is the beginning of the 60s. We were a country that fought big. Everything was bigger. Number one, the largest, etc. We did one called Think Small. And this caught on almost instantly. And you've never seen that before. Not if you had that much page, you're paying for it, use it. Do the car that big, is what everybody else does. 
But he didn't. We try to be captivating, or I try to inject a little humor, which was not out of line, and, uh, but uh, to make the advertising as entertaining as possible and create a personality for the car. What year car do the Joneses drive? Joneses drive a car, I don't know what year it is, because <laughs> they're driving a the Volkswagen. Whether it was the current year or four years old, nobody knew the difference. When you look at the posters they did, I mean, of course, you know, we talk about the classic print ads and they were beautiful and the art direction and everything like that that was fantastic. But in some ways, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at the posters that they did and, and they're, they're, they're even a more refined sort of version of the campaign and actually in many ways uh, are even better. You know, wonderful examples of taking you know, a big idea and, and reducing it down to a simple, powerful thought to enhance that idea. There was extra headroom in the Beetle. And they could have done an ad, if in England you might have done an ad with a policeman with his helmet on inside the car, so, in, you know, dramatically, charmingly indicate how there was extra headroom. The idea of getting the tallest basketball player in America and trying to get him in the Beetle and then him not to be able to get in it. And then in the copy saying, but don't worry uh, if you're not six foot seven <laughs> or whatever it was, because his teammate, who's only six foot two, got in just fine. I mean, that's just a fantastic idea. Yeah, the one that mainly knocked everybody on its ass was uh, the moon landing. When they just, all they had the next day was a picture of the, uh, the shuttle and it just said it's ugly, but it gets you there. And the VW logo didn't say anything else. People were tearing that out of the papers and pinning it on their walls. It was so cool. It was so understated. It was so, we don't have to shout. We don't have to put everything. We'll treat you like you've got the brains to work it out. The great uh, commercial that influenced, I think, every single commercial director was the Volkswagen Snowplow commercial, um, which is so brilliant because it's desperately simple. And, uh, and yet, it so fantastically it explains how brilliant that particular car is. You know how, you know how how, how does the man who drives the snowplow uh, get to the snowplow? In fact, I think that he actually uses the word drive as the verb twice. Get would be slightly better. ever wondered how the man who drives a snowplow drives to the snowplow? This one drives a Volkswagen. So you can stop wondering. I mean, there's a sensational shot of the snowplow going across foreground, re re revealing the, the funny little, little Volkswagen in the background, which is how he got to the snowplow. I don't know that there's a more powerful commercial. Uh, and certainly there was never a more powerful commercial that was done before. I don't know there's ever been a more simple, powerful commercial that's been done since. And boy, did we try to copy it. You have to, you have to kind of love uh, the, the funeral uh, as a TV uh, spot. I mean... You know, the idea that you're going in, you're selling this idea to, 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 to advertise your car. You go to the client and you say, the script basically will be a funeral. All right? That's the, and you go, what? A funeral? You must be... Yeah. And the voiceover is the man who's dead. What? So you're, you're, you're trying to sell a car by a man who's dead and this is his funeral and he's reading out his last will and testament. And you say, I guarantee it will be wonderful and it will be funny. I think it is genius. <laughs> I next release Navely, being of sound mind and body, to hereby bequeath the following. To my wife Rose, who spent money like there was no tomorrow, I leave $100 and a calendar. To my sons, Rodney and Victor, who spent every dime I ever gave them on fancy cars and fast women, I leave $50 in dimes. 
to my business partner, Jules, whose only motto was spend, spend, spend. I leave nothing, nothing, nothing. And to my other friends and relatives who also never learned the value of a dollar, I leave a dollar. Finally, to my nephew, Harold, who oft times said, a penny saved is a penny earned, and who also oft times said, gee, Uncle Max, it sure pays to own a Volkswagen. I leave my entire fortune of $100 billion. One of my uh, favourite commercials is the Jones and Krempler commercial with, you see, two identical houses. I can still recite every word of that commercial. Mr. Jones and Mr. Krempler were neighbours. They each had $3,000. With his money, Mr. Jones bought himself a $3,000 car. With his money, Mr. Krempler bought himself a new refrigerator, a new range, a new washer, a new dryer, a record player, two new television sets, and a brand new Volkswagen. Now Mr. Jones is faced with that age-old problem, keeping up with the Kremplers. We are here 50, 60 years after this stuff ran, but it looks as fresh and clean and is as amusing and as powerful as it was in 1959. They are so modern. They are as modern as anything that you would look at if you opened a magazine or a newspaper today. Uh, they haven't dated at all. You know, I always think that it created modern advertising and to this day it still has relevance. It simply looked at the product and said, I'm not going to try and hide what it is. I'm going to take what it is, i.e. that it's ugly but it works, and actually I'm going to turn that into a value. And there's so many lessons people can learn from that, not just in advertising but in politics and in entertainment and in all kinds of areas when they should sort of look at the Volkswagen campaign and say that's the way to think and be. I think it was the right car at the right time treated in the right way. It was a brilliant campaign, and, and it was something that, that Julian understood from the beginning, that this was an ugly little or sweet little bug, and it was a beetle, and that, that uh, America should think small. And, and what Helmut brought to it was kind of that uh, the very, very simple, t tremendous total simplicity, um, and uh, that touch of uh, Germanic workmanship, you know. From the moment the first air van, you know, you just, you could, you know, uh, you know, all my Jewish friends ran out and bought Volkswagen. I mean, it was appalling. <laughs>